Um, perspective is a wonderful thing. And um, when I was given this passage to preach on, um, my mind went to a completely different perspective, and I want to share a story with you. I'd never seen my dad so excited. He came home in a massive rush, barely able to speak. And I said to my mother, and he said to my mother and I, quick, pack something warm, grab a snack, we got to go. I didn't get a chance to hear much of the conversation that he had with my mum, partly because he was quite breathless, but he wanted us to follow him. There was something happening out of town somewhere and he had seen something that he just couldn't explain properly. There'd been a couple of men who had come into town and they'd done some amazing things. But I don't know any more than that. It was just such a rush. So mum grabbed some bread and we were off. Dad normally had a long stride. I could usually keep up with him, but today his legs seemed a little bit longer. I was trotting just to keep up. Strangely, as we left town, the crowd on the road increased. I saw a friend of mine with his parents and his sister. She was smaller and her dad was carrying her. Everyone seemed to be rushing. I didn't understand why, but I followed my dad as a good kid would. Got that, kids? Yeah. We stopped by the lake, and there were hundreds of people milling around, looking disappointed. Dad walked us to the beach, and he looked out onto the lake and exclaimed with excitement, Over there! They're over there! They've gone! And he was off again. I looked at Mum, and her cheeks were flushed red. The crowd was huge by now, and I knew that if I lost Dad in the crowd, it could take ages to find him again. So I followed as best I could. We walked for an hour or more and came to another beach, with a large hill that seemed to come straight out of the beach. It rose quite high. And near the top of the hill, probably 50 to 60 metres away, there was a cluster of men and women sitting around one man. The man was standing and talking to them. And Dad was heading straight for this group. We ended up about 10 metres away. And I looked up, looked up at my father and he was positively gleaming. The crowd around these men was thick. We could just hear what was being said over the noise of the crowd. The man in the middle was looking over this crowd, and there was a, a look in his eyes. He had such caring eyes and a real expression of concern. I heard a voice, not his voice, but another voice saying, Rabbi, this is a remote place, and it's already very late. We need to send the people away so that they can go throughout the countryside and the villages to buy some food. Food. As soon as he said it, my stomach started to grumble. It had been hours since I'd eaten. We were getting ready for our midday meal when Dad rushed in and started us on this journey. And in all the rush... I hadn't thought about food, but now, thanks to this random man, I was hangry. The thought of walking further to try and find something to eat was not appealing. And then I remembered the loaves that mum had grabbed. Good thinking, mum. She was a keeper. The men in the middle were starting to walk throughout the crowd to see what food was available. And one of the men walked up to my mum and she reached into her bag and pulled out three loaves of bread. I thought, hang on, if you didn't come prepared, get your hands off our food. And as I thought that, I remembered that I wasn't actually prepared. It was mum who thought to bring the food. I looked up at mum, and she was handing all the bread to this man. So I was gonna have to walk. I couldn't fault mum. She had a heart of gold and would do anything for anyone. I watched as the bread went back to the man with the eyes. He gave an instruction for everyone to sit down. So I sat between mum and dad, and then it happened. And if this is what excited my dad, 
I understood in that moment. He took the bread. He lifted it up. He asked for God's blessing to be placed on the bread, and then he broke it. He handed it to the men, who then started passing it around. He did the same with a couple of small salted fish, and they too were handed out. And I can't explain it. I don't know what happened, but I ate. I ate at least the equivalent of a whole loaf of bread and half a fish. And strangely, I could smell mum's signature spices from the bread around me. Everyone around me ate well as well. I lifted myself to my knees and looked back and saw that the crowd had covered the whole hill. And they were all sitting down and eating. The crowd was huge. I'd never witnessed a crowd like it. Not even in Jerusalem at the feasts. When we'd finished eating, there was so much food left over. We sat and we listened to the teaching of this rabbi. He made sense. He just made sense. Sitting on that hill that day was the only time I had the opportunity to listen to Rabbi Jesus. Not many months after, he entered Jerusalem and I heard stories that he was put to death. But that day, on that hill, I will never forget what I saw, what I witnessed, what I heard. Ironically, we went home with enough bread for the three of us and some fish. Now, some years later, I met a group of people who called themselves Jesus' followers. And when I heard their stories, I knew that this was the same man. And so I chose to follow him. And now my wife, my children, and my grandchildren follow Jesus. Now, I love stories, and often when I read scripture, I think about the different perspectives in stories. Now, what I just shared is from my imagination, so you won't find it in the Bible. But here at SAJ, we're thinking about ripple effects as a part of our self-denial series. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 appears in each of the gospel narratives. But I've based my thoughts from Mark's gospel. And in this gospel, we have this encounter where Jesus and his disciples are trying to get away to recharge a little bit. The 12 disciples have just been in pairs in the surrounding countryside, in the towns and the villages. And Jesus is teaching them that in the balance of ministry, there are times where we need to reset. But the crowds, and possibly these are the same people that the disciples have actually um, encountered in those towns and villages, the crowds have followed and they want more. They want to meet the rabbi whose students have done these miracles and have taught about repenting. Jesus and the disciples can't avoid the crowd. I don't know about you, but there are times for me when I get home and I am done. Anyone? Yeah, uh-huh. I don't want to know any more about anything. I'm just done. I've done my dash. A key lesson from Jesus is that even when you're done, in the midst of your doneness, you should always have compassion. Jesus was getting away with his people to a quiet place. Yet he had compassion on the crowd. And then he performs this incredible miracle. He feeds 5,000 men, and there were women and children there as well. That's a lot. Now, you need to understand that the larger towns in that area would have had about 1,000 to 2,000 people in the towns. So this was a significant crowd. Think about the impact on that crowd. Think about the ripple effect. I imagine this boy, in that moment, the impact is pure amazement. I'm sure that for the day, the weeks, possibly even the months that followed, his mind would have been drawn back to what he had witnessed on that day. I imagine the potential of him meeting someone after Pentecost, possibly one of the disciples, or Paul, or even a person who had come to faith 
on that day of Pentecost and hearing the story and putting two, to, two and two together and choosing himself to follow Jesus. And the impact that would have been on his family for the generations to come. I'm trying to paint here a picture of the potential ripple effect of this story. The image of 5,000 people having this moment, having this moment of encounter with Jesus, and then the possible effects that could follow. You and I, we, are in a privileged position, especially if we have encountered Jesus. The privilege is that we have a certainty about life and faith, a life on earth. Jesus has said to us, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And we also have a certainty about life after death, the promise of eternity with Jesus. To quote JFK, with privilege goes responsibility. With this privilege, the privilege of knowing Jesus and being in a relationship with Jesus, we have a responsibility to share our story. That boy, when he was at home, would have been talking with his friends, the friends that had been on the hill. They would have been sharing their experiences. And for the friends that weren't there, for whatever reason, I'm certain there would have been an amazing retelling of what had happened. Now, as often happens, the further away from an encounter, the murkier that encounter can get, to the point where it becomes a distant memory that has little impact on our life. But Jesus wants you and I to encounter him daily, to meet with him daily, to have a fresh, daily passion for him that will become infectious to those who are around us. That's his desire for us. The disciples had made a, res a reasonable response to the needs of the people on that hill. They had suggested that it was late. They said that to Jesus that they would be hungry and that Jesus should tell them to actually go into the countryside, find food, find shelter. Remember, this is a significant crowd. But Jesus saw this as an opportunity, a teaching moment. Remember, he was tired. His disciples were tired. But he saw this as an opportunity, a teaching moment, an encounter moment for the disciples. So Jesus asks, how much food have you got? Now, this event on the hill was unplanned. There were no caterers around. So they managed to rummage up some bread and some fish. And Jesus took action. And he made a point of involving his disciples in this miracle. They had to do some work. The miracle occurred through Jesus. The disciples participated through their faith in him and by following his instruction. As I've said, we're in a series called The Ripple Effect. And it's based around our self-denial program. I've had the privilege of being on the mission field. In fact, I was born on the mission field in Africa. I've served in Bosnia by myself, and with my wife we served in the Bahamas. And we've witnessed faith and action. The faith of, and action of many who have supported the work that we've done on the front line. We've been blessed with prayer warriors covering our lives with, a, with active prayer. And we've been in institutions where we've had to face huge hurdles and have been aware of that prayer support from a distance. There's also been financial support. The impact of decisions made on Sundays like today can be felt around the world. God blesses the money that is gifted and it, it does amazing things. Lives are changed and transformed because a group of people decide to support from a distance. Think of the ripple effect, the life you live, 
the compassion you have, the witness you are, and the effect your faith in Jesus can have. Think about the ripple effect, the compassion you have, the faith you have, the action you take to support this year's self-denial fund, and the lives, the people that will be impacted with every cent that is given. Over these next few weeks, as we consider what we are seeing and what we are hearing as a faith community, even when we are tired, especially when we are tired, I ask you to listen to what the Lord is saying to you and to respond with compassion and to respond with faith and action.